Khalifa and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events that have taken place around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Conservatives triumph in high-profile local and statewide elections in the U.S., dealing a blow to Democrats and liberals. The Republic of victories could have ripple effects for the 2016 presidential race. Russia and the UK suspend flights to Egypt following indications that a bomb downed Russia's metro jet plane, killing all 224 people on board. Holidaymakers from these two countries shifted out amid demands for security and justice. Russia pushes to broker a political solution to the crisis in Syria, tones down outright support for President Assad, seeks participation from opposition groups in talks to be held in Moscow. And Nepal's Prime Minister warns of humanitarian crisis due to the blockade of its border posts with India by groups opposed to the new national constitution. He has blamed India for the volatile situation. Our top focus on the show this week. In the US, conservatives triumphed in high-profile local and statewide elections earlier this week. Voters delivered big victories to Republican candidates in the Kentucky governor's race. Matt Bevan defied expectations to become the second Republican governor in over 40 years. Bevan defeated Democrat State Attorney General Jack Conway by nearly nine points. The win gave Republicans control of 33 governorships, a net gain of 12 since Obama became president in 2008. More importantly for him, it has set up a high-stakes showdown over the future of state-level health care reform implementation. It also highlights how fragile the reforms are in the face of continued opposition. Uh, joining me for a chat this week to talk about this is uh, former Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs, uh, Pinak Ranjan Chakravarti. Ambassador, thank you for joining me on the program. You know, are these state-level or local-level polls going to have any kind of bearing on what's going to happen next year, exactly one year from now in 2016? Well, it certainly shows, shows a trend. But uh, let me also uh, put in a caveat here, saying that sometimes state-level elections are about local issues, whereas the presidential election is about national, global issues. Hence, it is not perhaps, uh, we should not, in a very sort of emphatic way, feel that a conservative victory or a Republican victory in the states would automatically translate into a Republican victory at the presidential election level. But then it's very difficult to say at this stage who will emerge as the, nom the nominee of the Republican Party, who will emerge as the nominee, and it will depend a lot upon the individuals concerned. Indeed. That is how the stage will be set up with the individuals. You know, polls are predicting at the moment that it's going to be a Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, uh, you know, when it comes to 2016. Do you believe that? Because when Donald Trump's name came up about a couple of months ago, or, or even before that, three or four months ago, everyone just dismissed it, saying that, you know what, he's going to drop out eventually. But it doesn't seem so, because he seems to be getting more and more you know, popular among uh, the Republicans. Well, everyone had at one time dismissed Ronald Reagan as well. Yes. I mean, he was, he was just an actor from Hollywood. But then he um, became one of the most popular presidents that the U.S. ever had. Now, I'm not saying that Donald Trump is in the same mold. And Hillary certainly, Hillary Clinton certainly is, a, is going to be, a, uh, I think, a very uh, powerful candidate if she makes it to the Dep Democratic Party's nomination. She seems to be the front and she seems yes. to be heading the right way. She has the experience, the background, etc., and everything. And uh, and I think the Republicans uh, um, will also have to find a candidate. They don't seem to have found one who is clearly the right candidate or has miles ahead of the others. But Donald Trump, of course, is a figure, as we all know, has. But again, nobody can be written off at this stage. But my guess is that the Democrats will finally maybe pitch in for Hillary Clinton as, the, as, their, as their nominee. What do you think is going to be Hillary Clinton's uh, biggest challenge? Well, I think the first big challenge would be that she's, um, she's a woman. I mean, uh, the U.S. has never had a woman president. Yes, yes. And, uh, but that she's also well respected in the sense that people do regard her as having a lot of experience behind her. She's been Secretary of State, which is a 
the number three position in the hierarchy in the United States. So I think uh, she will have a lot going for her. But then people will find fault for many other things, policy disputes, liberals, conservatives, all kinds of things, abortion, you know, foreign policy, Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, everything will be, uh, will be put in the, in, the, in, the, in the debate and everything. But then I think she, um, she has shown that she can handle these kind of things well. And what are the factors do you think are going to influence these polls in the United States come 2016? Is it going to be you know, some of the localized issues or is it going to be some issues that happen you know, probably in the Middle East, Syria and all of these other issues that you brought up? Do you think they are going to be you know, issues on the ground there? Essentially, I think there will be a lot of domestic issues, you know, health care, etc. will come up. There will be issues of these. I think Obama, for example, has clearly heeded the public opinion in the United States by, by withdrawing from Iraq, by now trying to withdraw from Afghanistan, and of course not joining in the war, at least with ground troops in Syria. So there is a mood against, uh, against all this in the United States that... Why get involved in all these things? But then there are people in the United States who believe that the United States is a global power and they must impose their uh, will and dictate on many, many countries. But then I think uh, the people of the U.S., I think, uh, the Americans are, I think, quite fed up with these wars. After all, it costs a lot of money. Indeed. Indeed. It costs uh, lives of Americans. And uh, I think the public opinion has turned against these kind of wars. You know, let's talk about Donald Trump now before I let you go finally, of course, because Donald Trump has taken a very aggressive approach. He's, uh, you know, he's in, in his most recent comment, he said that he's going to bring back jobs from India and China. He's not given a roadmap as to how he's going to do it. But do you think that that approach is working for him and Americans, you know, are taking to that approach? Well, let's, let's face it, in all election campaigns, there is a great deal of rhetoric. I'll bring back jobs, I'll create more jobs, etc. All these things are, once the elections are over, I think the corporate figures who actually decide where the jobs are going to be, they will decide where the factory is going to be established. Not, not Mr. Donald Trump or the president of, uh, of the country. The president can, of course, follow through with such promises by making it, let's say, taxing certain things which makes it difficult for the corporate. But don't forget, the corporate world is also a heavy spender in these elections and contributors. So, you know, it's a, it's a balance that they have to maintain. Indeed. But it's always, a, it's always a popular thing to say that I'll create more jobs, I'll bring back jobs that, uh, that have gone out of mm. America. These are very popular things. Almost every candidate is going to say this. Indeed. So I don't think that we must read too much into this. All right, Ambassador, we'll have to leave to that. Thank you so much for joining us on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on now, of course, investigators are trying to determine what caused the crash of Metrojet Flight 9268 that killed all 224 passengers on board. But Russia, in the meantime, said it was in favor of suspending flights to Egypt. The decision came a day after security sources in the UK and Europe said a bomb might have caused the plane to crash midair. Here's a detailed report. Hours after UK indicated that Islamists planted a bomb on board the airliner that killed 224 people, the Russian Foreign Ministry accused it of not sharing information about Saturday's deadly plane crash in Egypt. Honestly, what is really shocking is the realization that the British government has some kind of information that could shed light on what happened in the skies above Egypt. And it turns out that the information, if it exists, and judging by the fact that it was pronounced by the head of foreign office, it does exist, that information was never shared with the Russian side. This is truly shocking. Although British Prime Minister David Cameron later said it was more likely than not that a bomb brought down the plane, Foreign Minister Philip Hammond said they'd received secret intelligence on the event. What we need to put in place is more security at that airport so it's safe to fly people home. That's our priority. That's what we'll work with the Egyptians to do. Look, we cannot be certain that the Russian airliner was brought down by a terrorist bomb, but it looks increasingly likely that that was the case. And
Earlier, the UK suspended flights indefinitely to and from the Sharm el-Sheikh resort from where the flight had departed. He assured all UK nationals will be held to leave once extra security measures were in place. Russian PM2 has ordered additional security measures in the wake of the Egypt plane crash. Now we've worked with the Egyptians very closely. The Prime Minister spoke to President Sisi on Tuesday evening. I spoke to my Egyptian counterpart yesterday. Our security people and our intelligence people have been in very close contact with them. I would like to ask you separately to work with all aviation authorities of those states where our planes fly to take additional security measures. Forensic evidence including flight recorders is still being analyzed as relatives of the crash victims seek closure. Bureau Report, Rajasabha TV. Well, we'll slip into a short break now, but still to come, emergency is declared in the Maldives and the political upheaval there intensifies. That and much more on the other side. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Sean Russell. I'm Tracy Shinshi and you're watching News Tonight. Together with the team of our dedicated professionals from across various fields. This is Shamsundar Vishal Dahiya, Akhile Suman, Frank Pereira from Beijing, China. Priti Mishra for Raj Sabha Television. We bring to you the news that matters here on Raja Sabha TV. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, airstrikes by Russian warplanes on the Islamic State-controlled Syrian city of uh, Raqqa killed 42 people this week. The stepped-up attacks came in the backdrop of indications that it's looking for viable options by hastening the end of the conflict. Signs that Russia is looking for options to end the civil war in Syria. Last week, besides holding joint exercises with the US, Moscow claimed that retaining President Bashar al-Assad was not crucial for it. We never said that Assad has to leave or that he has to stay. We said that unconditionally for the statehood of Syria, it is a key moment in the fight against terrorism as well, because if there won't be a Syrian state, there isn't anyone that would fight against terrorism on the ground. It is the reality. And the second moment is that the fate of the president of the country needs to be decided by the Syrian people. Russia says Syrian people should decide Assad's fate. In Damascus too, elections are a big part of the debate on how to end the crisis. If this ends the crisis, then why not? I want elections if they serve the best interests of the country. But many feel holding elections amid the relentless war is unrealistic. Now at present time, I think it's very difficult to arrange for new presidential elections uh, because, as you know, some parts of Syria are occupied by terrorist groups. A lot of Syrians are displaced inside and outside Syria. Uh, this means that the most important thing before uh, talking about elections, to whether it was parliamentary or presidential, the most important thing is to put into terrorism and to launch uh, a political series including elections and other choices for the Syrian population. For Russia, the big task is to decide who are the terrorists and what is the legitimate opposition. There are two lists that need to be agreed upon. The first one is of the terrorist organizations to which a ceasefire, which we all hope we would manage to announce at some point, would not apply to. And the second list is of opposition delegations, which will hold talks with the government under UN auspices with a coordination role by the representative of the Secretary General. Russian media is also reporting that Syrian government officials and opposition members could meet in Moscow later this week. Although the U.S. State Department says it is premature to invite Syrian opposition to talks. Why, why, why? We, we think it's premature. 
We think that, that there's a lot of work that is done. We thought there was a good start in Vienna. The stakeholders came around the table, including Russia. We believe that as we continue to work through the dynamics of what was agreed in Vienna, and I'd refer you to the communique, um, that there will come a time we think it's premature before the Vienna group meets again. Like Moscow, Tehran is also a staunch backer of Assad. Much in opposition to Saudi Arabia, Turkey and their Western and Gulf allies. So far, Iran has shown no signs it's ready to dump Assad after the war, which according to the UN has killed a quarter of a million people. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, let's now take a look at some other news-making events that made headlines across the world this week in Globe Watch. The Maldives declared a state of emergency on Wednesday as the Indian Ocean Island nation's political upheaval intensified following a suspected assassination attempt on the president. The country's foreign minister said the emergency would remain in force for 30 days. Authorities have uncovered stashes of weapons believed to have been hidden by President Yamin's opponents, primarily Nasheed, who lost the 2013 presidential election and was jailed for 13 years in March on charges of terrorism. The presidents of Mexico and Cuba stressed mutual interests and admiration on Friday, announcing new accords and closer political ties after more than a decade of chilly relations. Pena Nieto greeted Cuba's Raul Castro in Merida, where they held private discussions. The bilateral visit is the first since Washington and Havana announced a historic rapprochement last December. Mexico is eager to stake its claim as Cuba's principal bridge to Latin America and the leaders signed accords on tourism, agriculture, education and migration before scheduled talks with a delegation of Mexican businessmen. Dozens of flights to and from Bali in Indonesia were cancelled and airspace closed for close to 48 hours due to a drifting ash cloud from Mount Rinjani east of the island. The volcano had erupted on Tuesday evening, spewing massive clouds of silica ash into the skies. The ash cloud also delayed the deportation of gangster Chota Rajan to India from Bali, where he was arrested early this week. He was deported to New Delhi on Thursday night. Rescue teams continue search operations through mud and debris for dozens of people missing after a pair of dams collapsed at a Brazilian mine on Thursday. At least 45 people are still missing after the disaster at the Germano mine near the town of Mariana in Minas Gerias state. Walls of water filled with mining waste cascaded downhill when the dams burst, engulfing a nearby village in a sea of mud. The fast-moving wall of water tore off roofs, leveled trees and swept away cars in Bento Rodriguez that has a population of 600. A tremor in the vicinity of the mine may have caused the dams to burst. A cyclone with hurricane force winds made landfall on Yemen's Arabian Sea coast on Tuesday, flooding Mukalla city and sending thousands of people fleeing for shelter. Officials and meteorologists said the storm is the most intense in decades in the arid country, whose storm response is hampered by poverty and a raging civil war. In Mukalla, water submerged cars on city streets and caused dozens of families to flee to a hospital for fear of rock slides. Moving on, now Nepal is blaming India for the economic blockade caused by the protest of the Madeshis on its borders. Taking the issue to the UN, its new Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli accused India of causing a situation that it said was more inhuman than a war. Oli also uh, expressed anger against India for campaigning of uh, human rights violations at the United Nations Human Rights Council. Let's take a look now at how the situation unfolded this week. Police in riot gear clashing with rock-throwing protesters in the Nepalese border town of Birganj. The blockade imposed by the protesters has kept a stranglehold on Nepal's fuel supplies. Matters came to a head when the police shot dead an Indian. India's consulate general said the government had already warned truckers to move into Nepal at their own peril. 
We have also written for compensation to government of Nepal. The border is open for people's movement, but not for the goods movement as present because the condition in Nepal side is very tense, and uh, because of the security concern, government of India has issued the order that uh, the um, truckers or others should move on at their own risk. Prime Minister Narendra Modi condemned the killing and spoke with his Nepali counterpart K.P. Sharma Oli to seek details about the incident. Family members of the victim, Ashish Kumar Ram, alleged they had to call Indian officials to get his body from a Nepali hospital. We had to call up the embassy. The officials came, then we got the right documents and the body. Angry people shouted anti-Nepal slogans when the body was brought to India. The incident came as yet another blow to the Indo-Nepal relations with outfits in Nepal alleging India's hand in the protest and India denying the allegations. Meanwhile, a team of Nepal's National Human Rights Commission is investigating the death. Nepal's ambassador to India, Deep Kumar Upadhyay, condemned the incident and has promised comprehensive probe into it. The National Human Rights Commission has seriously concerned the The National Human Rights has shown its serious concern in the matter. We have immediately developed a mission to investigate the case. The commission has gone to Birkunj and has already working on the case. With a landlocked Himalayan nation of 28 million recovering from its worst earthquake on record, the government turned to China for extra fuel. The Madeshi community continued to impose an economic blockade against the new constitution despite police crackdown. They are against splitting Nepal into seven provinces. Protests over a new constitution turned violent in August, leading to more than 40 deaths. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, let's shift focus now and bring you up to speed with some big events from sporting arenas around the world this week in our segment Sports Action. Belgium have topped the FIFA World Rankings for the first time in history by surpassing world champions Germany by two points. According to the latest rankings, Argentina slipped down to third ahead of Portugal, while Chile climbed up to fifth place to reach their highest position. Meanwhile, Spain finished sixth ahead of seventh place Colombia and eighth placed Brazil, who have won the World Cup five times. England also made slight progress by moving up to the ninth spot ahead of Austria. Liverpool coach Jurgen Klopp has dismissed rumours surrounding former skipper Steven Gerrard's return to Anfield as a player but revealed that he will be happy to see the stalwart train alongside his squad. Klopp, who succeeded Brendan Rodgers as manager, described Gerrard as a legend and said that he would have no problem if the veteran midfielder wants to train at Liverpool ahead of the next season in LA. Earlier this year, Gerrard bid adieu to his boyhood club after 17 years to play for the Los Angeles Galaxy in Major League Soccer. Pakistan spinners displayed a sparkling performance to help their side beat England by 127 runs in the third and the final test in Sharjah on Thursday and thus clinched the three-match series 2-0. Chasing a target of 284 runs, England were bundled out for 156 despite a valiant effort from skipper Alistair Cook. Shoaib Malik, who was playing his last test, claimed three wickets by giving away 26 runs, while Yasir Shah chipped in with four wickets. Zulfikar Babar and Rahat Ali also shared three wickets between them. The former head of World Athletics is suspected of receiving over 1 million euros in bribes in 2011 to cover up positive doping tests of Russian athletes. Lamine Diak's family dismissed what it called the excessive and insignificant accusations and Russia said it had nothing to fear from the latest scandal to rock World Athletics. Diak, the former head of IAF, was placed under formal investigation in France earlier this week on suspicion of corruption and money laundering. The Court of Arbitration of Sport on Thursday dismissed an appeal by Italy's Valentino Rossi, motorcycling's former world champion, to set aside his punishment over the Marquez kick incident. During the October 25th Malaysian Grand Prix, race officials found that Yamaha's Rossi deliberately ran wide, resulting in contact with Honda's Marc Marquez, who fell off his bike. The current championship leader appealed the three-point penalty that forced him to start from the back of the grid in Sunday's final race in Valencia.
And finally, he is amazed with the difference because it's made up of over 80,000 balloons. Its creators in Mole Town of Belgium said that this creation, which took more than 25 people some three days to build, has over half a kilometer of walkways for people to lose themselves in. I'll leave you with these pictures of the orange wonder. See you again next time.